You know, all I wanted for Christmas was a new chair and instead I got the flu. There must have been some confusion. I'm so sorry I missed last week. I posted on my social media that I had the flu and it sucked. But honestly, I really needed that little break. So I appreciate you guys for understanding that sometimes stuff happens. You gotta take care of yourself. My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday. And should we get a new theme song for 2020? No, okay, sorry. Which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. If you are new here, hi, my name is Bailey Sarian, and every Monday, except for last Monday, every Monday I sit down, and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my noggin, and I do my makeup at the same time. If you're interested in true crime and you like makeup, I would highly suggest you hit that subscribe button. I'm here for you every Monday. Before we jump into today's story, today's video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. Yay, I love Hunt a Killer. <laughs> So what's Hunt a Killer, you ask? It's the game that gets you off your phone and thrusts you and your friends slash family into an ongoing murder mystery investigation. Hunt a Killer is one of the fastest growing subscription boxes in the country. You'll go through documents, evidence, audio recordings, and case files, eliminating suspects, putting pieces together until you crack the case and catch the killer. I mean, if you can. Plus part of the proceeds for every box goes to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization that helps with real life cold cases. It's a unique game where it really comes down to you and your investigative skills, which I thought highly of my investigative skills. You want me to solve a murder? No problem. Turns out, yeah, I'm having a hard time there. <laughs> It's challenging in a good way. It's different and it gets me using my noggin. Just for my subscribers, you can go to huntakiller.com and use discount code Sarian for 20% off your first box. Again, use discount code Sarian for 20% discount. A big thank you to Hunt a Killer for partnering with me a handful of times now and I just love them. So I am more than happy, but most of all, thank you guys so much. Cause if it wasn't for viewers like you, at the end of the day, I wouldn't be here. So thank you you. I want a new chair. I still want it. I'm gonna just have to get it myself. Now for today's story, inspired by a Christmas gift, actually, my sister gave me this for Christmas serial killer coloring book. Oh baby, let me tell you, while I was staring death in the face, I just was going through and coloring all these serial killers and I came across this guy who I haven't colored yet. I'm so sorry, I, did, I should have colored him for the video. Randy Craft, the scoreboard killer. And I was like, who are you, you little weirdo? And so I was sent down a rabbit hole. <laughs> oh my gosh, this guy. So we're gonna be talking about Randy Craft here. Shout out to my sister for getting me the serial killer coloring book, having the time of my life. Okay, so we're starting off the new year. My extensions are falling out. We're starting off the new year with a serial killer and his name is Randolph Kraft. If you're ever curious as to what products I'm using, I link the products down in the description box as well. I'm excited to see what 2020 has in store for us and I hope your 2020 is as bright as my forehead. I will shut up and let's get into today's story. Warning, the following presentation is intended for mature audiences. It contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, adult dialogue, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. So Randolph Kraft was born March 19th, 1945 in Long Beach, California. Randolph, who went by the name Randy. Now Randy was the baby of the family and the only boy. So he was showered with attention from his mother and his sisters as well. Um, but it's said that Randy's father was like super distant and didn't seem to want a relationship with his son at all. And he preferred, the father preferred to spend most of his time with the, his daughters or his wife. He had a pretty good upbringing, pretty normal. The only thing Randy said that was like rough for him when he was a kid was that he was prone to accidents. At the age of one, he fell from a couch and broke his collarbone. And then a year later, he was knocked unconscious uh, because he fell down a flight of stairs. Like, like he was always tripping and falling. But that's what Randy said was like the only thing that was 
rough for him was he was prone to accidents. But isn't it a little suspicious? Like, how do you just fall down? A, well, I fell down a flight of stairs. Randy's family ended up moving to Orange County, California when he was three years old. His parents purchased a former women's army dormitory and they converted it into, or they converted this big structure into a three bedroom home, which sounds cool as shit. And you know, the house was very modest. So then at the age of five, Randy went to elementary school as a child does. Randy's mom was a member of the PTA. She baked cookies for the Cub Scout meetings and she made certain that her children received Bible lessons every week. Now, Randy, he did amazing in school, he excelled, okay? And he was recognized by um, all of his teachers and even the school that he was like an above average student. In junior high school, he was placed in all of the advanced classes and also advanced programs outside of the school. Now, by the time Randy had entered high school, he was the only kid from his family still living at home with mom and dad. His sisters had like moved out, they got houses of their own and they were all married at that time. And since both parents worked, were not often around, Randy was pretty independent. Randy had his own room, his own car. He was working part-time and making money there. So he was able to get his own car. So Randy would say that he got along with his peers. He had friends, he wasn't bullied, he wasn't picked on. He had a great childhood. So. Good for him. While in high school, Randy played saxophone in the school band and his parents were conservative. So he participated in a lot of conservative political groups within the school. I don't remember that in high school, but I guess they had like a conservative group. So he participated in that. And then Randy graduated from high school when he was 18. Out of 390 students, he was 10th in his class. So Randy said after high school or like senior year slash like when he graduated, that's when he really started to cruise around um, gay bars and he started hanging out there and getting familiar with the whole scene. Randy enrolled at the Claremont Men's College and he got a full scholarship and he majored in economics. It just all around sounds like this Randy guy is great, right? Of course not, why are we here? During his sophomore year of college, Randy became involved in his first openly homosexual relationship. Now, Randy would say that his homosexuality, it wasn't a secret at his school and amongst his peers and his friends, but his family was still completely unaware um, that he was gay. And his family was super conservative. You know, he knew he, he knew it was gonna be a situation. While still in school, Randy took a part-time job working as a bartender at a popular gay bar. During that time is when, you know, Randy was kind of getting, figuring out what he liked. He began cruising for male sex workers at known pickup spots around Huntington Beach. Then in 1963, Randy went to look for a male sex worker for the night. Unfortunately, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, bummer. It was uh, the, one of the guys he was gonna pick up that night was actually an undercover police officer. Randy got arrested. And luckily for Randy, it worked out because his charges were dropped because he had no previous arrest record. They had no reason to, uh, I don't know, I don't know. They just did. In 1967, Randy started to have reoccurring headaches and stomach pains. He didn't know what was causing it and it was causing a lot of issues just in his his life and his well being. So his doctors ended up prescribing him tranquilizers um, and pain medicine, which he often mixed with alcohol because college. Randy lost interest in school and his grades just really started to plummet. So it took him an additional eight months to graduate from college, but he did end up graduating and he earned a Bachelor of Arts in Economics. June of 1968, after scoring high marks on the Air Force aptitude test, Randy then enlisted in the US Air Force. He threw himself into his work and quickly advanced to the rank of airman first class. It just seemed like whatever Randy put his mind to, he was really good at 
about it. Finally at this time is when Randy decided to come out to his parents and tell them that he liked men, he was interested in men, he was gay. His father was like ultra conservative and his mom was like, Meh, she was conservative, but she didn't approve of his lifestyle, but like she still loved him. She still supported him. His father, who he'd never really had a good relationship with, he just completely lost his shit. It was at this time, his relationship with his parents changed. They didn't really speak to him as much. Then in July of 1969, Randy received a general discharge from the Air Force on medical grounds. Randy claimed that the discharge came after he told his superiors that he was gay. So he was really sad by this, that he got discharged and he ended up moving back home and he took a job as a forklift operator forklift operator. And then he also worked part-time as a bartender. So then in 1971, Randy decided that he wanted to become a teacher. So then he enrolled in the Long Beach State University. And then while he's there attending school, he met another student, his name was Jeff, and they really hit it off and they ended up dating. They ended up moving in together and they were together until the end of 1975. So about four years. Randy would say it was Jeff who introduced him to bondage and drug enhanced sex and also threesomes as well. The relationship, I guess, was pretty rocky. They fought all the time. Randy just really wanted to settle down and be in a relationship, a monogamous relationship. You have no idea, side note, you have no idea how long I've been sitting here trying to say monogamous, monog monogamous. <laughs> Maybe 2020 will be the year I, I pronounce things better. No, probably not. I, okay. Anyways, so yeah, Randy really just wanted to stop with like the threesomes and just be in a relationship one-on-one. -on -one. They decided to go their separate ways. 1976, it was about like a year later after the breakup with this Jeff guy. Um, Randy goes on to meet another guy named Jeff. He has something with Jeff's. Okay, but they met at a party. They ended up hitting, hitting it off and they were together for about a year. This Jeff, he was 19. Randy was 10 years older. So Randy was 29. Randy would say that like he was the mentor in the relationship. He introduced this new Jeff to the gay bar scene and taught him about cruising a nearby Marine base for partners to engage in threesomes, which is weird because Randy said that he wanted to stop with the threesomes, but we can't judge, but I'm judging. And they ended up purchasing a home together in Long Beach, California. And then Randy ended up getting a new job. He was working for a computer um, company. With this job came a lot of travel. So he would be um, on business trips all the time and he would go to Oregon, he would go to Michigan. Every week he was going somewhere new. You know, that's really hard in a relationship. This new Jeff was like, I want you to be home more. And Randy was like, I don't really wanna be home more. I like my job. They ended up splitting up in 1982. So then he finds a new Jeff. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that is Randy's whole story. Now, May 14th, 1983, two highway patrol officers, they spotted a car. This car was weaving down the road and it wasn't just like a one little swerve, like they went to grab something and you swear. No, it was like a, this person's drunk, let's follow them. So the officers signal for him to, to pull over. So they pull the car over and then Randy actually gets out of the car and starts walking towards the officers. Police officers say that they could smell the alcohol. He just reeked of alcohol. They just kind of take a look at him and they see that he's just a mess. Like his shirt's all, buttoned incorrectly, it's untucked. His pant zipper was down. It was like, what's this guy doing? He just looked a little rough. So of course, police officers give him the standard sobriety test. And of course, Randy ends up failing. So they handcuff him and they put him in the back of the police car. That's when this other patrol officer goes to check out Randy's car. They didn't have a chance to look into his car yet, whatever, but they walk over to his car and they look inside. I laugh when I'm nervous if you're new, hi. Okay, thank you. So they look into his car. What do they see? Okay, let me tell you. They see a young man in his car and his pants are pulled down. He was barefoot. He was slumped over in the passenger seat. This young man isn't responding. Take a closer look and they see on his neck, there seems to be like signs of strangulation and his wrists were bound with what seemed to be like a, some rope. Try and take a pulse and this man is 
dead. Randy, what the hell are you doing? They were able to later on ID the victim and he was a 25 year old Marine who was stationed nearby. Friends reported that um, this young man, he was at a party and he ended up hitchhiking home. So his autopsy revealed that he had been killed by strangulation. Also it indicated that his blood contained extremely high levels of alcohol and tranquilizers. You know, when police are searching Randy car, they're going through the trunk just to collect any evidence or anything they can. And they come across um, in the trunk of, the, the, of Randy's vehicle, there was 47 Polaroid photos of young men, 47 photos of young men. They were all nude. They all appeared to be unconscious or possibly dead. They couldn't make the assumption that they were dead because I mean, they don't know. It's a photo. It was one or the other. In the trunk of the car, they also find a brief briefcase. Inside of it, they say they found like a list on a piece of paper and it was like this weird cryptic message, okay? But it had 61 different, they just called it cryptic messages on it. Investigators came to believe that this list was Randy's scorecard or like a list of Randy's victims. Because once they start looking at it, the best way I can describe it is like he created names for people or his victims since he couldn't remember anyone's name or maybe he didn't want to put their names. He instead would give them a nickname or something that he knew what it meant. For example, there was a name like Marine Drunk Overnight Shorts. We don't know what that is, but obviously that's something. Marine Drunk Overnight Shorts. Or there was one person called Deodorant. I do this in my phone all the time because sometimes I can't remember people's names and it's like too late to ask them what their name is or maybe they just told it to me and I already forgot and I don't wanna look like a dumbass. So I'll be like person at the gas station with hair. I think I have a good amount of people in my phone who's like, I'm just describing them. <laughs> it's not funny because this was, this is serious. Okay. I'm distracted because I'm happy to be back, I'm sorry. It was obvious that this this list or this scorecard wasn't supposed to make sense to anybody. It was just supposed to make sense to Randy. So Randy was arrested, obviously, okay? Sorry, I forgot to mention that. He was arrested. Then investigators end up going like and searching Randy's apartment and they gather more evidence. So there's like clothing there that's owned by potential victims. They gather fibers from his rug and they end up matching it to fibers that were found at a murder scene that went unsolved. The drawers next to Randy's bed, there are three different photos in there which are, include three different cold case murder victims. So investigators are like, what the? This guy has been hiding some shit. So then of course, like investigators go down their list of cold cases or unsolved murders, and they were able to link a handful or a good amount of unsolved murders to Randy. And they were able to link them because of the location. They could confirm the location to where Randy would be at the time. Also how they were found. These victims were all very similar to each other. And what Randy would say was his signature. And and Randy's signature, forgive me, this is, there's like, I, it's, Randy would put something like a sock up their rectum. And in some cases, he, Randy would put something way worse, just objects, but mainly a sock. Also, Randy would burn the nipples with like the car cigarette lighter. So on his victims, he would burn either one nipple or both nip nipples. He would strangle all of his victims. And I'm sorry, boys, I'm sorry about this one, but Randy would also chop off the victim's balls and wieners. He was sick. That's not even, what? Yeah. So when they go down the list of Randy's like known victims, they are able to see that he definitely had a type. Okay. All of his victims were Caucasian males with very similar physical characteristics. Some were gay, some were straight. A lot of them were more like muscular, handsome, I would say. All of his victims were tortured and murdered, but torture seemed to vary by degree from victim to victim. Most were drugged with like a tranquilizer and bound. Several of the victims were found with their, again, their, their wieners chopped off and slash or their balls. And then Randy would take a photograph of his victim once they died. Now the violence that 
Randy's victims endured. It seemed to correspond with how Randy and his lover or whoever he was in a relationship with, how they were getting along at the time of the incident. So if his relationship was not doing well, it seemed like his victims were just really tortured. It was all bad, but you know, it was just different degrees of bad. I will say that investigators were able to link so many unsolved murder victims to Randy. It's amazing that they were able to do that and give like these families closure. I guess if like trying to see the positive, I don't know. It's, a, it's like 61 people and they were able to put a lot of these together. So on the list, number one was stable. And this turned out to be um, Wayne Joseph Duquette. And he was 30 years old and he lived in Long Beach. Then we had another name, EDM. And this stood for Edward Daniel Moore, who was, a who was only 20 years old. And this poor guy, he was found on the side of the freeway, this poor guy. What was he doing with them though? If Randy ended up like chopping, removing a piece of the victim's body, they never like found it. So there was um, someone on the list named Twiggy, and this ended up being a 19 year old named James Reeves. His body sadly was found again near the freeway. There was someone on the list called Pier Two, and they linked it to the victim, Thomas Paxton Lee, who was 25. He lived in Long Beach, and they found him on a pier in an oil field. Someone by the name of Skates. This person was John Liras, and he was 17 years old of Long Beach, and they found him him sadly floating in the surf at Sunset Beach parking lot. And this was linked to a man named Keith. He was 19 years old of Long Beach, found him just rough. Sadly, this victim was chopped up and they found his remains in different areas. I don't know, what was he doing? The victim that I had mentioned earlier named Deodorant, this poor, poor victim was only 16 years old. His name was Robert. Uh, he lived in Los Angeles and they found him next to the Hollywood freeway in Los Angeles. On the scorecard, there was the word dog and they were able to link that to Raymond Davis and he was 13 years old. And sadly, this little boy, he was visiting Los Angeles and he had gone to the park to look for a lost dog. And that's where Randy picked him up. They go through and they are able to link a lot of these with Randy. Randy, right? Okay, so he's arrested. His trial actually begins September 26, 1988. His attorneys were doing the most, really trying to prove that Randy was not guilty. Their main defense was that all of the evidence was circumstantial. They mainly focused on his life and his upbringing and tried to focus all the good things that Randy had done. He was an outstanding citizen and there was really no proof that Randy did this. Yeah, he had photos. Yeah, he had a list, but there was no like DNA on the victims that linked to Randy. There was no concrete evidence that Randy in fact did this, that had, he had killed any of them. And then the trial ended up lasting 13 months and it would prove to be the most expensive trial in Orange County history to this day. August 11th, 1989, the jury rendered a verdict of death for Randy Kraft. Randy Kraft actually remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison in California out here. Not out here, it's up north. It's uh, you know, one of the worst prisons, I guess. I had family there, <laughs> not funny. Okay, and to this day, Randy continues to deny guilt for any of the homicides for which he was convicted or he is both convicted or suspected of committing. I mean, okay, look, I'm getting so flustered today. On Randy's scorecard, there were 61 names. So they believe that there was 61 victims. Not all of them were, they were able to locate or find. And to be fair, a lot of people didn't think that Randy was responsible for all the deaths that investigators attached to him. Many believed that there's no way he could do this all alone and get away with it for so long. Victims were dismembered and then spread across town inside of Randy's vehicle, 
inside of his home. There wasn't like a lot of blood found anywhere or tools. So it's like, where was this happening? And a lot of people just thought like investigators linked Randy to these victims because they were similar. But conspiracy time. Let me bust out my coloring book because there's this other serial killer. Maybe in future videos, instead of using like images I find online, I just use my coloring book images from now on. So get this, <laughs> there's this other serial killer. <laughs> I haven't colored him yet. His name is Randall, Randall the I-5 killer. Now a lot of these victims were found on the I-5. This guy is suspected to have 18 to 44 victims. Now the I-5, Interstate 5 freeway, it goes everywhere, right? This serial killer used to just go up and down the I-5, kill people, and then also leave the victims on, sometimes just on the side of the freeway, just like in this case. A lot of people who believe that the victims that were linked to this Randy, Randy Kraft, were actually victims of this guy. Now, there's also a theory that Randy Kraft, this man, the I-5 killer man, and do you remember the toolbox killers? The white creepy van? Awful human beings. It was two men, Lawrence Bittaker and, God, what was his name? This trifecta of serial killers were actually working together, moving victims and spreading victims. I mean, it could be true because how did this guy, Mr. Kraft, how did he do that all by himself and nobody caught on? Nobody saw anything for that long, you know? I kinda, mm. Which side note, Lawrence Bittaker recently passed away in prison at San Quentin. He was there as well on death row with his friend, Mr. Kraft here. Oh fuck, you know that they were conspiracy together. Oh geez. He actually recently passed away last month. That guy was disgusting. I did do a video on them. I'll link it down below if you're curious about it. So yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting that the conspiracy, I guess, that they were all working together. And plus this I-5 freeway killer man, it seems to make more sense about the bodies that were found on the freeway. Right? Anyways, in the end, Randy never like confessed to any of them doing any of this because there was no physical evidence linking him to the bodies. I don't know. So this is where I rely on you guys to hand over your theories because you guys in the comment sections always have the best theories that I've never thought of. I'm like, you're onto something. So that's the story about Randy Kraft, this disgusting human being, killed a lot of people. It's so sad, a lot. 61 that they know of. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Please, please, please be safe out there and make good choices. Please, please, I care about you and I want you to be safe, yes. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you have a wonderful day ahead. A big thank you to Hunt A Killer for partnering with me on today's episode. I hope you have a good day. You make good choices. Let me know down in the comment section down below who you would like me to talk about next week. But other than that, I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.